Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Radio Days, a podcast radio program that delves into the world of terrestrial radio. It's DJs and on-air personality, and you, all fans of the radio as a medium. Here is your host, Ron Robinson. Hello and welcome to the Radio Days, the streamcast. Radio Days, the streamcast, episode two of season three where uh, we not only offer this audio podcast for your enjoyment, but now you can watch this uh, this uh, this podcast uh, via streamcasting. Um, you can check that out on YouTube, also at ronrobinsonstudios.com. This week uh, is part two of my interview with Ken Calvert. You can also hear part one, if you haven't heard that one, double back and check that out. You can, do, uh, you can listen to that podcast as well as many others. Uh, at ronrobinsonstudios.com. Just hit the podcast uh, button and it'll take you right there. Um, Before we bring Ken back, uh, today's episode is brought to you by NRM Streamcasting, Radio Days, the docuseries, and my very, very newest sponsor, which I just appreciate so much, the Linda Ray Team Real Estate Professionals. This first segment is, in fact, sponsored by the Linda Ray Team. To tell us more about this fantastic real estate real estate squad. Here is Linda herself. Hey, Linda, how are you? Hey, really good. How are you guys doing? Doing very, very good. Uh, 2023 has started off strong, and uh, and that's no different in real estate. What uh, what's going on in the real estate world right now? I am so pleased with all the negativity out there. This January has been one of the hottest Januaries we've ever enjoyed. Uh, houses flying off the shelves, actually, and you know what? A lot of our buyers. And uh, are enjoying four to five percent interest rates, even though that they're boasting them up to six and three quarters, simply because the sellers are buying their interest rates down. And uh, you can give me a call if you want to know how that works. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot of houses selling, a lot of houses of all price ranges, a lot of people in putting their houses on the market, getting ready for the new season. All right. Well, uh, you can see the number and the email, uh, the 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 uh, web address there on the screen. But uh, for our uh, audio listeners, uh, how can they get in touch with you? You know, simply you can just Google us. Uh, that's the simplest way. We're everywhere, but it's the phone number is two four eight seven zero nine three seven eight six. Love to talk with you. You know, we've got a lot of knowledge, but that's not the most important. Uh, it's who we are. So give me a call again at two four eight seven zero nine three seven eight six. Love to hear from you. And Linda, thank you so much for being a sponsor. So before uh, before we welcome back Ken for part two, I want to share some background because um, I think unless you've listened to the podcast where the late John O'Leary inter- you know interviewed me about my career, you know a lot of people you know why are you making a documentary about the history of radio? Who are you? Uh, well, um, you may or may not know, but uh, I-, I wanted to give you a little background. Um, as to why I'm producing this podcast, in in essence, is to produce and you know broadcast and and let the get the word out there, promote um, that I'm making a doc. Well, I'm almost finished with it. A documentary about the history of radio. Uh, fact is, I've been working on this project since 2014. Um, it started out as a documentary film, and it's turned into a five part docu series. And I've been working on it for over eight years. Um, but if I'm being honest, the idea for this documentary was planted when I began my career in radio almost 25 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. So, um, just in case you don't know who I am or why I produced a docuseries about the history of radio, um, here's, here's my background and how I, uh, came to put this documentary together. So I started my radio career in 2000, um, as a student at Spex Howard School of Broadcasting. Um, while I was there, I scored an internship at WJR. I was answering phones for Joe Gannon, the appliance doctor. I'm sure you've heard of the appliance doctor. Um, and I remember what was cool about that is it was weekends and I would come in and, and produce a show for him and he would pay me a couple hundred dollars out of his own pocket because it was an unpaid internship. So I always loved Joe for that. And, um, and, uh, so then from there, I took a, a job a, in the news department at a station called WKLA, which was in Ludington, Michigan. And, um, you know, I was there for a, a couple, couple, couple years, two or three years from there. I went to St. Joe Benton Harbor where I was in the news department and I, I turned that into a morning show gig on their sister station, which was a country station, which was a lot of fun with uh, wild bill. I've, I've had him on the podcast. Uh, uh, I can't remember when that was, I think season one. Yeah, while Bill came on and we talked about his career. Um, but um, 
learned a lot in Benton Harbor, St. Joe from a lot of different people, um, covered the Benton Harbor riots there. Uh, Jesse Jackson and Governor Granholm came to town. It was, it was quite an interesting time to be there. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot about the business uh, there in St. Joe, Benton Harbor, not just news, but, uh, you know, on the FM side of, of things. From there, I uh, I came back to the Detroit area, worked part-time at WJR. I got a gig with the uh, the Tigers for a while. I was also teaching at Specs Howard School. So I was a student there, and then I came back and, and became an instructor there and had a lot of cool gigs and, and a lot of cool experiences while I was there. And, and when I left there, I actually left the state. I went to uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, where I eventually uh, became a, a program director. That was a, a station called KMAG. And, uh, yeah, that was a, a, another great learning experience. But then, you know, then I switched gears and came back to Michigan in 2010. So I was in, in Arkansas for like three years, came back to Michigan, started my own video production company, and uh, pretty much since 12,000, or excuse me, 12,000, 2014, I've been uh, working on this documentary, which, like I said, started out as a movie, uh, but now it's uh, turned into a five-part docu series. So that that should keep you, uh, you know, get you up to speed and and you know, kind of give you an answer to who I am and why I came to do these this project and and of course this podcast is to promote that docu series. Um, so you know, with that in mind, with no uh, further ado, um, let's uh, let's join up and. Uh, We'll, we'll join part two of my interview with the casual one, uh, Mr. Ken Calvert. Enjoy. Welcome to part two of my interview with Ken Calvert. This segment is brought to you by uh, Radio Days of the Movie, 101 Years of Radio, where you can find more information out at ronrobinsonstudios.com. As, uh, as we kind of ended off at the, the, the previous uh, segment, uh, Ken, we were, we were kind of moving on to your WRIF days. In 1981, you along with, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, Karen Savelli and a couple other people, you guys were kind of handpicked to make this all-star team at WRIF. Why did you leave the, the record industry to come back into radio? Could you talk about that? I was in my kitchen in Chicago, and I'd just gotten home from a road trip. And maybe Johnson just got me at the right time. But I was, I was literally standing in the kitchen, phone rings. This was pre, pre, pre any phone identification. You answered it when the phone rang. Right. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Galvert, Johnson here. You're coming home. And I said, well, let me look at my book. I may be in Detroit. And he goes, no, you're coming home. There's an opening at, um, at WRIF, and we're putting the band back together. I said, Jim, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have a job, a good job, and it's with CBS Records here, and I'm living in Chicago. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know why I would come back to uh, want to do radio, because he said, we're putting the band back together. It's you, Arthur. Karen Savelli, and I believe at the time it was J.J. and the Morning Crew. It was Jay Brando who was doing Middays. Wow. It was Arthur doing Afternoons. Michael Stevens was in there somewhere. Too. Michael Stevens was, was he already gone. I think he was already gone, Buzzy. I think he was already gone. The, Sorry, but anyway, any I anyway, I said, uh, okay, I'm flying into Detroit. I forget I was working a record. And when I say working a record, when you came to town, you went to every radio station in town with the new, like I said in the, the previous podcast, you would come to town with the new, if you had a Billy Joel record, you would certainly take it to all the FM radio stations. You would also take it to the AM radio stations because you were pushing a single from that album. Um, anyway, Glass Houses, for example, Billy Joel, and you were pushing it still rock and roll to me. Right. All right. So that's so you would spend two days, do a couple of dinners, two lunches, and then get back on the plane, fly home, and wait for the conference call and say I got the song added at CKLW, at which point I would get a big bonus and I was done for a couple of weeks. Because anytime you got a record added at CKLW, that means that they would come in for fifty thousand orders right. for the record. Johnson caught me at the right time. I flew into Detroit, I was doing something. Went by and I saw the radio station. Obviously, it was two trailers together, and it just had this like this W four type bunkhouse feel to it. And I remember I I did not know Tom Bender. I did not know Tom Bender. I knew Tom Bender from being on the air, and he did a a, a, a night show, and um, and it may have only been on Sunday nights, but whatever. I knew the name. 
I sat down with Bender across the street at a Holiday Inn, and we had a very we had a really good chat. And he was like, "Why does Johnson want to do this thing?" Uh, I said, I, "I don't know." He says, "Well, he keeps telling me because he knows it's going to work. He knows it's going to work." JJ and the Morning Crew had just left W four, where they were huge. Right. By the way, and, we had just uh, I had gone to Riff at that point after five years at oh, W four. Okay. Yep. And Jay Hoker was the general manager. Yep. And he said, and the ratings came out, and it was the first time that anybody had beaten Riff. And W4 beat him, and that was our target, target, target. Yeah. And he said, why don't you go celebrate with those people? You've earned it. And so I went back, and we had a party, and we you know, did all that. And then I recruited Savelli and anybody else who yeah. wanted to come. Yeah. And well, told Bender this is you know, and Johnson was already there. Yeah, it was it was before me, so you can yeah. take total credit if you want. I don't and, care. And no, I mean, I'm just it, it's what happened because yeah. I I knew that 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 was a magic formula. All those people, and uh, so they did it, and you came, and the rest. I mean. Well, I just remember that um, the guy that I worked for back in Chicago, his name was Don Van Gorp, and he was our regional manager. He had a big gig with CBS. Uh, there were only three others in the entire United States, and I, I, he liked me. He liked me a lot. He liked every, he liked everything that was going on, which was cool. And I, so I went to him and I said, "Hey, listen, I'm thinking about um, going back to radio." And he was like, "God damn it! I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! I knew it!" He said, "I know." for a fact that your first interest is your best interest and that's radio and I just knew that someday you were going to do this to me but god damn it please rethink it I'd really love to keep you here I rethought it and I said I've got an opportunity I had a good lunch with Tom Bender I had dinner with Jay Hoker Hoker basically said back to Bender I like the guy but I don't know him from Adam it's your call you you're higher here so you had JJ and the morning crew the next thing you know I'm doing middays at WRIF and Arthur's following me in the afternoon, followed by Karen. No, I think Karen Sabelli was doing 10 to 2 at night. Yeah, in fact, she was. And I can't tell you, it was, I know that I, I was there before Steve Costan, so I don't know who was doing 6 to 10. But I, I'll tell you who it was. Carl Coffey. Carl Coffey. Yep. It was Carl Coffey. And so Brando got bumped to the all-night show. Carl Coffey went to 10 to 2. And now we had the lineup set up and ready to go. And indeed, off we went. And I didn't get, I got a few phone calls, like, what happened to Brando? You know, I mean, but nothing overwhelming, nothing mm-hmm. big time. And I asked Bender, I said, are you getting hammered by who's this guy doing? And he said, no. People are like, you hired Ken Calvary? That's, you know, more of those. And then what'd you do to Brando? And uh, and Brando's a, such a great guy. He's a really good guy. And just a, it was actually the best thing that ever happened to him because he ended up going back to Flint, where he was the king of the market in radio, and got his job doing the news, became the Bill Bonds of Flint, you know, yeah. Flint, Flint News. I mean, it was amazing. So one of the things you made you you were known for at Riff is the the crossovers with Arthur P. Yeah, and it was only because it was Theater of the Mind that came. Right. We, we had these brand new, but when we moved from the from the trailers into the brand new building, we had this floor to ceiling glass. And and it was just wonderful. From it, although I love the trailers because if somebody was running down the hall, the skipper or the the record, the record, the record would skip. And I remember one time we used to open the windows on a day like today, and it was no screen, just the window on the back of a trailer. And I remember one time a squirrel jumped in when Arthur was on the air, <laughs> and he flipped out, and it was just great radio. And it was also cool because at the same time we, I always wanted to work for an ABC type radio station. We had to do the network news at the top of the hour, and we had to learn how to back time. So, you know, you kind of go three, two, one, and go. You know, coming up on the other side of ABC News, I've got Journey, I've got some Billy Joel, I also got Twin Spin from the Beatles. But right now, let's check in. Right or right now, it's, you know, what da 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 And all of a sudden, you get this, you know, you get this little chime through your headset. Bing, bing, three, two. And then, from New York, I'm Don Sawyer. I was like, how cool. I'd nail it every single time. So, we were rocking, and we were rolling, Arthur was notoriously Arthur. I never got to see him coming in at the trailers because I was looking into the backyard. Uh, He, when we were in the new building, I could see Arthur coming in. And Arthur was never on time. And Arthur always drove a convertible. And Arthur was always just blowing right by the gatehouse. 
and he would swing around, and I could see him swing around in the park, and he'd come through the back door and just come blasting in. And I remember he, he he was one that he got up about 15 minutes before he was on the air. He came in wet hair. About 15 minutes. Yeah, he had this big glorious perm and this huge Billy Gibbons beard. And he'd come through the door soaking wet, right out of the shower. And he would say to me things like, well, I do, I do the things I do to myself. <laughs> and I said, why do you? I don't know. That's why I just asked. <laughs> and he would snap at me. And I thought, why are you snapping at me? I just asked you an honest question. You know, why do you do it then? Why stay up so late? Oh, I don't know. But anyway, I can't do them today, but normally I can. Anyway, he, I, it, after a while, it started to piss me off. I mean, it was like, can't, God damn it, how hard is it to just show up for your job? I wanted to say it. But I knew I could not say that. There was no right. way I could say that to Arthur Pennell. Anyway, I thought, well, if you're not going to be here, I'm going to introduce you. I'm just going to make fun of you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I thought, the and then I just decided that the best day to do it and throw it back in his face was on Friday. Friday. To kick off the weekend. And I was looking for a reason to play this song by Jeff Beck and the Yardbirds. Um, and it was a boogie-woogie tune and called Jeff's Boogie. And so our Arthur would, and I, I took this piece from the Moody Blues, and I just sort of created this, ladies and gentlemen, the staff and management of WRIF have assembled here in the hallways, every member of the staff, including upper management, middle management, lower management, everyone in the building is invited to participate. <laughs> How did I dare say invited? They were, yeah, they were charged, they were uh, um, uh, whatever it was. You just made a huge word salad. About, yeah, about yeah. the introduction. But, but yeah. I, yeah, but it was anyway. Staff and management now with their heads looking firmly down is the mission statement here is to simply never make eye contact with the great Poovah on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so as we speak right now, I'm looking at eight cent. I'm looking at eight, um, uh, what did I call them? Uh, what were the uh, manservants called? Oh, the, um, oh, no, no. Oh, the, the. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember, but it was the manservants ever so carefully now heading out into the parking lot. We are now waiting on Arthur Penhollow to arrive on the premises. Always, <laughs> always a little bit late, but he's usually better when he's late. And, uh, and I see, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure the ladies can attest to that. And uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the Samoan, 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 the Samoan manservants are now, oh, uh, and they were like, and we had this. This soul, seventh soldier from Moody Blues playing in the background, and he would like I said, they're now walking out to a 1963 Econoline uh, Ford van. Uh, I said it's airbrushed, and on the side it says if this if this van's a rocking, do not come knocking. <laughs> and the license plate the license plate says, um, don't laugh, your daughter may be inside. Oh, <laughs> you don't dare say that now. No. Believe me, that was so it's a different non time. For sure. oh, it was a different time. No calls on that back in the day. Anyway, I would then like wait and wait and wait for him to come in. So I just had to keep making it up as he went along. And then finally, somebody would give me the cue that he was actually on his way in. And we would have the, oh, uh, And as he'd open the door, I'd hit Jeff's boogie. And I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Arthur T. Pornhollow, Penhollow, Dr. Frankenstein, Steen. And I said, um, man responsible for, uh, it's a man's world, don't be a fool, stay in school. And I just, there's anything that came to mind, I just started rambling it out. And I said, this man was once seen at a miniskirt convention wearing chrome-plated clown shoes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and I remember that was the one that people would often remember. And so I wrote them every single week. I wrote, I, I just absolutely wrote every single minute of it, and it became iconic to such a point where they could break down the cum for that quarter hour, and it was beyond, the, it was, nobody had ever seen anything like it. And people often ask, what did you do with those? And guess what? No clue. They're no long. Heaven. No. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody thought. You know, it's so bad that we worked in that period of radio where everything was done on tape. Right. And it was before they were taking tape machines out of the studio because they were just in the way. Special programming on the weekends was played on reel to reel. And it got so that they could do it from another studio. Right. 
So you could put in, what did they call those those cassette tapes? They were uh, trackers or whatever that you had to have rolling. You had carts. There's carts. Well, no, no. There was, no, there was a, it's called a skimmer. skimmer. Oh, okay. And on one side was, at the tone, the time will be 12, 22, and 30 seconds. Beep. At the tone, the time will be 12, 33, and 40 seconds. Beep. And that was in one channel. And then the other channel was the actual radio broadcast. But it was running at such an incredibly slow speed that you could, the only reason why they used it was to mitigate the fact that you did not say a certain thing at a certain time when a listener would call saying, he said shit on the air. When? Right. When about? He said it, it was right around midnight, and they could go and listen to this thing, right. and they'd never find it. So it was just stuff like that. But anyway, I never kept one, and I, my kingdom, I still to this day Didn't get letters for it. That. But you got to realize, people, my, the people that were rocking it 70, 75 years old now, and they're still looking for it, and so am I. And the same thing with Chuck Roast. I don't have one Chuck Rose cassette. Now, I say that letting you also know a ton, as well that I have hundreds of cassettes in in my basement, but I have no clue. what the, I didn't mark anything. They're just cassettes. So I, I don't know. But I'll, I'll transition that in because also when you were at Rift, that's why also when you got approached by the Pistons, didn't you? Talk well, I, about- I'll tell you. And so, yeah, the, the final part of my, my legacy going from W4 to all the other radio stations to WRIF, the best time of my life, was the fact that I believe that Buzz and I on occasion would just say, we got nothing going. You want to run out to the Pistons game? The Pistons were playing out at the Silver Dome at the time. And we'd go out. And tickets were five bucks. Mm-hmm. But they had the main event. And the main event was a really cool bar. It was a great place to have a couple of beakers, a couple of see, right, right. a couple of see-throughs, and mm-hmm. then go down and watch a little of the Pistons action. And at that time, it was the Ricky Mahorn we had traded for, and a couple yeah. of other things that happened. The fact that they made the um, uh, the lame beer trade, and uh, so I was out there, and we were sitting. We always had great seats. Station had great seats. Yep. And so we'd always just take the station seats. I think we were five or six rows up, and somehow we started communicating with the guys in, at the uh, at the scorers table. And I think Joe Nune was a buddy of yours, and mm-hmm. Joe Nune. So one, next thing you know, next time, next thing you know, I'm upstairs at the uh, main event lounge, and Gary May, who was the voice of the Pistons, sits down, and I did my impersonation of Gary May. And he said, "You know, that's pretty good. If he ever, uh, if I I coach football, and you could fill in for me during the uh, uh, the exhibition season." I said, "Oh, okay, I'd love to." And so. Did a couple of games that year in the Silverdome, and I was terrified, but I knew if I just did game show Ken, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'd like to ask you to please rise and join us in honoring America as Dr. Tim Coldiron will perform <laughs> our national anthem, you know? And at this time, you know, let's meet some of the world's greatest athletes. Well, I just added that. He didn't have that. And somebody would hand me a sheet of paper with the starters on it. And just the starters, just the starters. Don't right. read the whole team, just the right. starters. Got it, got it. So I got through that, and that was the year that we had drafted Dumars and Rodman. Mm-hmm. And, um, and near the end of the year, I when I would fill in on occasion, I just thought, well, Dumars, it ought to have some some pop to it. You know, like Lou Pinello, Lou Whitaker, and the uh, broadcasters would always say, they're not they're not booing, they're saying, Lou, Lou. Right, right. And I thought, well, we can do that with the Pistons, but we can do it better. And we'll, we'll make it a wow. That came uh, we'll from make it a legacy. That's item. awesome. And so, and Gary May wouldn't do it. Gary May did the full next year. He did his own, and he just would say, "Joe Dumars." He would not do it. So when I would fill in, I'd go, "Joe Dumars from Isaiah Thomas," and then I'd shut up and get out of the way. And so the next, the end of that year, get a phone call from Matt Dobeck, the late great public relations director, mm-hmm. and he said. Uh, I'm firing May. You're my new guy. I said, what? <laughs> he said, I'm going to fire Gary May. He said, I'm going to let him go. I don't mean to fire him. I'm going to let him go. And I said, what do I do? He said, he said well, you're going you're gonna to do it now. I'm going to hire you to do it. I said, do what? And he said, you're the, you the, do the PA for the, for the Pistons. I said, oh, I don't know if you've n- noticed this, Matt, but I have a day job. It's the radio, and they kind of like have ride herd over me. They can kind of tell me what I can and can't do. Radio station had no problem with it. They thought it was a great cross promotion. It was like I was doing a, pro- it was like I was doing a promo three times a week when they were in town. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, and so they thought no issues at all. And then they asked like, eventually, is there any way you could take bumper stickers out there and put them in the main event? I was like, I'll try. You know, I mean, I don't know, but you know, you'd send them down on the on the, even the scores table, and everybody wanted them for their kids or whatnot. 
So, it, but it turned out to be just it was hand in glove with what I was doing. It's just a great gig. It was it was so cool, and I got to grow up with the bad boys. I want to ask you about those two seasons specifically. What was it like to be in that arena every uh, night? Unlike anything I've ever seen. I remember at that time they had they had this huge, almost like the Miggy hits thing going, where they'd flip over the number of consecutive nights that we sold out the palace. Which to, to my, I just can't go by that that uh, property. I can't go by the area. That building was the nicest building still in the area. It'd be nicer than the LCA right now if they would have continued to just do what they did best, which was add on to it every year. I mean, they would have had more room to do more things, even cooler. The than... sight lines were incredible. <clears throat> the uh, the concerts there were sound perfect. Everything about that arena was incredible. It was unbelievable, and and Tom Wilson, to his credit, just did an incredible job. They would steam clean those the the, the seats every week. Modernistic was in there. I'd go out to do voiceovers, and Modernistic was in there just constantly cleaning the place. I mean, it was wonderful. And I don't know what Gores had in mind. I really don't understand what he had in mind, but whatever, he, it, it just... It doesn't you know, make any Mr. sense. Mr. Davidson yeah. was a hands-on owner. Mr. Davidson wanted that building out there, and by God, it was out there, and it was wonderful. And to, uh, to this day, I don't understand. But those two years were the most incredible two years of my life. I, I literally couldn't believe... Getting a ring, getting two championship rings, nothing. I mean, I can make... I could say something I won't say it, but I was like, that was the night that I almost passed out. I mean, I remember Tom Wilson handing me this box, this beautiful box, and me opening the thing up. And to see your name go around a ring with years and literally, wow. it had the, 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 the season <laughs> record, it had the playoff record, it had bad, it has bad boys on it. It was just incredible. I remember it was it was, and I got to be friends with the guys, and I could still see the guys to this day, even Lane Beer, and um, especially Ricky Mohorn will still bust my chops. Isaiah will always bust my chops. Every one of those guys, I saw Buddha at a CBS. James Edwards the other day, and man, I had no idea. I'm well, I am getting shorter, but he's getting taller. Well, yeah, that <laughs> makes that makes sense. But Buddha, I just sort of went. I didn't didn't know for sure if it was him. It had to be. Oh, he's just a giant. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. I went. So as I walked by, I went, James Buddha Edwards, and uh, he turned around and, and gave me a hug, and I thought he was going to snap me, <laughs> you know, snap me like yeah, you know. But uh, that, that's, that's uh, cool. it was just a, Chuck Daly. I'll never forget Chuck Daly. One time, I used to hang out underneath the stands on the way back out and just kind of watch. I actually, what I was doing is I had a beer in a cup, and I was finishing my beer in a regular soda pop cup. And uh, Daly comes walking by, and Daly, what are you doing back here? I said, eh, just finishing my, my, having a cocktail. He went, eh, good for you. He said, we ought to do something sometime. And I said, oh, I'd love to. He goes, here. He, he takes out a matchbook, and he writes down his phone number. I saw him four days later. He said, Hey, you never called. And I thought, I, I, I didn't think you were serious. You're Chuck Daly. And he was like, call me. And I remember calling him. One, and Ann and I, my wife and I, went out with he and Terry. I mean, I had a great time. But I, cool. yeah, just a one, not a bad apple there, I don't know. Rodman right. went nuts, but not on my watch. Right. Yeah, that was much later. Yeah, there. but it was absolutely the greatest thing ever. That was the greatest chemistry team in ever. Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I just wish that people didn't have to read about them or, yeah. or sort of live vicariously through me. I just wish, uh, you know, I mean, how many? Me, ugh, I don't even want. I don't want to go there. We're in the fourth quarter here, Cal. Yeah, Cal. no, um, no. I well, that I'll say because I, I know we're running out of time, but I do want to ask you about one more stop that you made. We, sure. Is 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 is. Not a lot of people talk about, but you went in to replace the legendary J.P. McCarthy at WGR. Can you talk about? I that? was one of the guys that they brought in at the time. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Lance, uh, but I forget who, who the other person was. Really, really good pipes and another really good guy. But he ended up going down south you know, to Indiana or, or south Ohio. Oh, really good. So I ended up doing J.P. McCarthy's program for probably six to eight weeks. I mean, mm -hmm. I was really – and then all of a sudden they found a slot for me because they decided Jimmy Lance had really gotten old that his bits just weren't singing in the shower. He wasn't doing anything. 
he was coming in and just taking up two hours of of screwing or you know whatever taking care of you know making it, his. They were showing up. That's he was did. yeah he, you know stroking his clothiers and and then all the people and it was just a bad what he did last night he would do two segments on. You know, so I'm at Joe Mears, and then, uh, you know, and uh, of course, you know. anyway, I ended up getting that gig, and I think that if I would have stayed there, to be honest with you, I, I think I would have done really well. I worked for a guy who almost destroyed my career, almost destroyed my career. Brent uh, Albert? No, oh. Al, Al, um, I don't know, but it's I... It's probably best you don't remember his name. No, either. it really is. Uh, he was short-lived anyway. Yeah, he, he, he went on to have a, a, another career in... The finance market. He ran um, Bloomberg. Anyway, long story short, I that was also when the the collision that occurred between Dr. Laura refusing to be heard from I believe eight to ten or ten to two at night, and more or less demanded middays ten to two, in order for her for ten to noon in order for her to renew her contract. And and Dr. Laura was huge. Was yeah. absolutely oh, she was. Yeah. was absolutely huge at the time. So, I mean, I remember once again, that was when I just at that point was like, there, there was, there just it was bad, bad, bad karma. And I just remember that uh, the general manager at the time, Mike uh, Feasy, Mike just sort of like told me that I was kind of out, but didn't really say I was out. And then he just went up north and he wouldn't wow. take, he would not take my calls. Yeah. And uh, my producer, and just a brilliant, kid great friend of mine who passed away suddenly kevin collard um was no one championed me more than he did he saved everything i ever did now there's a guy that all my stuff is on dad all of my stuff is on dad and i mean not quality first it was as good as it got so that's it i mean i went as long as i could and that's when that gap in my life when i worked for the palace of auburn hills in promotion and eventually, 2000, I got another phone call, and that was from WCSX. So yeah. I gave him put the band back together. Yeah, I, they gave, they gave, <laughs> I gave him. Well, almost. I, I still do pieces for him every yep. once in a while. But so that's the Ken Calvert story. You, you've had an illustrious career. So what, what's I have. What, what's next for you? I, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. I've been I dibble and dabble a little bit in podcasting, but uh, I've got the equipment. I've got all the equipment I need. But it's uh, you know I need a I need a mission. <laughs> I I need a mission. But uh, long story short, that's uh, that's what I'm doing right now. That's, let me let me yeah. ask you this. This is one thing that has nothing to do with you. But what do you, in your opinion, what is the state of ter- terrestrial radio in 2022? And I, how can it be better? In your I I don't know if I uh, I'll offer just a real quick uh, opinion that I have is that it's gotten totally away from the music. There's no passion. Anybody maybe NPR. Maybe NPR, but nobody's is, and maybe it's because the new music that's been coming out for the past 15 years, I can't stand. I don't think it's great music. I'm talking about rock and roll. I wouldn't know what I was doing at WRIF. I mean, somebody's got to explain it to me, and maybe they can, but I don't get it. I'm not a headbanger. I've got to have melody. I've got to. I've got to have good lyrics. And they moved themselves when the expansion was put into place for radio stations to own as many of them as their companies to own them. Yeah. They went to uh, economy of scale. They got rid of the talent. They got rid of the things that were connecting them to the marketplace that they served. And the music became vanilla at best. Yeah. And there's no anything. And I thought maybe this Ukrainian situation where there's war again would create passionate music like Vietnam did to create rock right the way it was created or reinvent it but it's yeah. it's just there's nothing to me and I am hey listen if it works for the, for that generation good mm-hmm. great I mean good for them it's just not mine I um, I'm not a techno but I get it I get thump 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 mm-hmm. thump thump I wouldn't know why there's a great DJ versus an okay DJ uh, I understand why the Techno Fest can charge fifty bucks for people to just literally right. turn around in circles. I mean, I, I mean, I get that. Um, music's always managed to find, you know, its 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 water level. It's usual, but it's to me nothing has moved. Nothing. Hip hop has moved. Uh, I mean, you know, credit to the hip hop world. I'm just not a hip hop guy. I never was able to memorize songs, and. Uh, <laughs> You have to. To me, the first rap artist ever 
was Bob Dylan with his continuous yeah. string yeah. of the old man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, somebody, somebody stole the handle. So, yeah. Do you have a favorite artist now? A favorite artist right now. Um, I'm a big fan of Chris Isaac. Yeah, I really like Chris yeah. Isaac. Anything he does, I just like. I just like Chris Isaac. I like his guitar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the way he looks, and I like the way he plays, and I like the way he sings. Yeah, I just like. I dig the guy. Buzz Van Houten, I want to thank you for joining me. Ken I Calvert, I thank you for taking the time. Yeah, opportunity. this is great, man. Congratulations and good luck with your movie. Thanks again to Buzz. Thanks again to Donald Schuster. And a, th- a big thank you to Mr. Ken Calvert for being the first guest of Season 3. Well, actually, the first episode of Radio Days, the streamcast, where you can see uh, visual, not just audio. Today's show is produced by Ron Robinson Studios. If you need professional marketing videos, professional photography, headshots, maybe you need drone video from a licensed drone pilot, Head over to ronrobinsonstudios.com. You can also hear previous episodes of the show there as well. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the upcoming documentary, as uh, Ken just mentioned, Radio Days, 101 Years of Radio, click on the Radio Days uh, link under the Documentaries tab at ronrobinsonstudios.com. Again, thanks for checking out this show. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your radio story. It's been an honor. Uh, to get to know you in this process. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Ken, and thank you for tuning in to Radio Days, the streamcast. Today's show is produced by Ron Robinson Studios. If you need professional marketing videos or professional photography headshots, maybe you need drone video or photography, head over to ronrobinsonstudios.com. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also hear previous episodes of this podcast, Radio Days, there as well. And if you'd lear- like to learn more about the docuseries, Radio Days, 101 Years of Radio. Click on the Radio Days, the movie tab under the Documentaries tab at ronrobinsonstudios.com. Thanks for checking out this show. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in next week. We'll have another fantastic guest right here on Radio Days, the podcast. Until next time. You can't go. All the plants are going to die.